You are listening to the Conscious Life Podcast, the official podcast of ConsciousLifeNews.com, where you can find the latest in the world of alternative news, health, hidden truths, and spirituality. I'm your host, Jonathan Wilbanks, and here with me tonight is the eminent UFO historian, Richard Dolan. This is the first of a three-part Conscious Life podcast series with Richard Dolan. Tonight, we'll be discussing the UFO phenomenon. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about the national security state. And finally, next week, we'll be talking with Richard about spirituality and consciousness as they relate to the study of UFOs. Now, Richard has some pretty impressive credentials, and I'd like to take just a moment to give a brief introduction on his background and work. Richard Dolan is considered by many students of the UFO phenomenon to be the preeminent historian of the subject. He is the author of two volumes of history, UFOs and the National Security State, as well as an analysis of the future, A.D. After Disclosure, The People's Guide to Life After Contact. Richard's writing is widely seen as ufology's gold standard. His seminal history, UFOs and the National Security State, has inspired such statements as The Best History Ever Written About UFOs by best-selling author Whitley Stryber and Masterful and Important by Dr. Edgar, Edgar Mitchell of Apollo 14. Richard has also written numerous articles, spoken at conferences around the world, is a frequent guest on radio shows such as Coast to Coast AM, and has done a great deal of television work. Richard studied at Alfred University and Oxford University and was a finalist for a Rhodes Scholarship and completed his graduate work in history at the University of Rochester. Prior to his interest in UFOs, he studied U.S. Cold War strategy, Soviet history and culture, and international diplomacy. He is also the host of Truth Out Radio Live with Richard Dolan, streaming every Saturday from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern at GlobalRadioAlliance.com. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Richard. Jonathan, what a pleasure. Thank you for having me on as your first guest. Well, it's, a, it's an honor to have you here, and we're really excited to uh, dive into this. So uh, I guess let's, let's go ahead and get started. So for the sake of all the skeptics out there, let's talk for a minute about the validity of the UFO issue. And what would you say to non-believers to convince them that UFOs are real? And why is this a matter that we should take seriously uh, for informed conversation and debate? Well, yeah, that's a great place to start. When I was a younger guy growing up, doing a formal study of history uh, as an undergraduate and in, in graduate school, I, I can tell you, as if you needed to know, UFOs don't come up as a topic of study. They're not taken seriously, not in the academic world, not in really any part of the mainstream world where uh, you know people want to be taken seriously. It's this topic that one must never discuss. It's almost the third rail of, of, uh, of politics and science and academia. Uh, I got interested in it, though, in the midst of doing uh, research of a doctoral dissertation. I was working on uh, the study of Harry Truman in the Cold War, circa U.S. military national security policy, circa 1950. Nothing to do with UFOs, but I, I will never forget this. I was in a bookstore, and I saw a UFO book. It was by the author Timothy Good, who many students will recognize uh, who Timothy Good is. He had a book called Above Top Secret, and it was the subtitle that really got my attention, the worldwide UFO cover-up. I'll never forget that. And I, I took the book off the display case where it was and just flipped through it. The thing that got my attention was simply that he had names of individuals whose careers I had studied in some detail, departments that I had studied in a great deal of, of detail, and, and was placing them in a context where, in my field of study, this was just not done. Uh, there were documents that were in that book that purported to be legit. It turns out they were legitimate. And, well, it turns out that Tim Good had done a, a very nice job in, in putting together an argument that the UFO topic was of interest to world leaders in military and the intelligence community and politics for many, many years. And I thought, well, that's crazy. No matter what the reality of UFOs happened to be, how is it that I had never read about this in any of my formal studies? I mean, really ask yourself, in what dimension of reality is that not interesting? Even if it was a mistake, if you find out that three four-star generals were actually in, uh, concerned about UFOs during the 1940s and 50s, why would that not be interesting in the context of the early Cold War and so on? So that was my jumping off point. And, and all I wanted to do at that point wasn't even solve the riddle of what are UFOs or what are we dealing with? No, I just wanted to know, was this part of my country's history? And if so, why? 
And if it ever ceased being part of the national security history of the United States, then how did that happen? Well, so all I ended up doing was to uh, start off with a basic bibliographic search of the field, something that any good student would do. You find out what's the good literature, what's the good argument that the believers make? How strong is that argument? That's really all I wanted to uh, resolve for myself, and that's really what got me hooked. Maybe hooked isn't the best word, maybe obsessed is a better word, because within a few months I was deep into this and I, there was certainly no way coming out. Essentially what I determined very, very uh, sufficiently early on is that the UFO phenomenon absolutely has engaged the military of the United States and militaries of other nations through uh, the violation of sensitive airspace. We're talking about objects that don't look normal, they don't act normally, they don't behave, they behave far beyond the parameters of our top aircraft of any era. And we have military reports uh, attesting to this. These reports were classified for many years during a, uh, a period in our nation's history in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, the Freedom of Information Act was quite liberalized at that time. And as a result of that period of liberalization, we obtained most of the UFO documents uh, that we have to this day. And I think that makes a slam dunk case. Not that UFOs are alien, not that uh, they're here to, you know, put us in some cosmic cookbook, but that UFOs are a real phenomenon exhibiting extraordinary technology that begs to be answered. What is that stuff? That's, that's fascinating. And, you know, on... On that note, you produced an, an astounding article, uh, I think a couple of years back, called 12 Documents That Take the UFO, 12, 12 Real Documents That Take UFOs Very Seriously. Uh, and we're going to be posting that at, uh, you know, the bottom of this interview uh, in the article on ConsciousLifeNews.com. And I also encourage anybody listening to this on other channels to seek out that article for themselves uh, at Richard's website, keyholepublishing.com. You know, I think it very clearly establishes that this is a real phenomenon, at least as far as the government and the military is concerned, which in and of itself is, is fairly damning considering the official denial, uh, you know, ad nauseum for the past 50 plus years that the government yeah. has no knowledge or interest in all of this. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that article. I, I wrote that article for explicitly to do what what it has done for you and, and hopefully for other people, which is in a, in, a brief, uh, in, a, in a brief piece of Internet real estate to just put out there a concise but very strong argument for some of the top documents. I think that that's a very good top uh, dozen documents. And they're fascinating. And what I did is I've got you got high-res JPEGs of the documents. You can see what they look like. And I provided my own analysis of each of them, not going on too long about it either, so it's – you know, you can read it all in one sitting easily. Of course, that tacks on to the, the work that I've done, my two volumes of history of UFOs and the national security state, which is a much more involved examination of that whole issue. But, yeah, that article really did what I wanted it to do. It's a nice, concise statement that uh, even even for hardcore skeptics, I encourage them uh, to look, them, look over the documents. And, again, it's not that we're out here to prove UFOs are extraterrestrial. I'm simply interested in an open examination of the UFO phenomenon because one thing that I, I feel we can take to the bank, the phenomenon is real. National security elements do not want to discuss it because, because I mean, realistically, these things are not containable. They are doing whatever they do, and our military shows there's no evidence that our military can deal with them in on any way like equality, not at all. Well, so if if we've established, you know, for the sake of argument and our and our listeners that the UFO phenomenon is real, uh, at least the government definitely treats it that way, and there's you know a tremendous amount of evidence from multiple different sources uh, that that very clearly demonstrate this. The next logical question then is, who are they? Whoever's piloting these UFOs, yeah. if they in fact have pilots, and and what do they want? Yeah, well, that's that's. Now we're getting into some very interesting and a lot more difficult questions. Uh, it's one thing to look at the historical record of released U.S. government documents, and also, let's not forget, released documents by a number of other governments as well that show that there's something very unusual going on. That's one thing. 
But now we have to extrapolate and find out, well, who could they be? Well, this is an issue that has that, that analysts have grappled with for a very long time. One thing people may not be aware of is that right back in the 1940s and 1950s, we, we now know that U.S. intelligence specialists who studied this problem, many of them entertained the idea that we were, in fact, dealing with extraterrestrials, or as they call it at the time, interplanetary visitors. That was a very widely held conclusion, as a matter of fact. Uh, now, officially speaking, that was never the determination. That was never what the government uh, would ever authorize out there. But we know that below the surface, the extraterrestrial uh, hypothesis was always popular. I still think that that's a real possibility. I mean, after all, look, we are in our own society just maybe a generation or two away from actually having some serious breakthroughs in our ability to traverse space. At least it seems that way to me when you look at all of the confluence of the technologies that we're developing now. Uh, I think we're going to have some very uh, robust space capabilities. And I have to assume that there's life elsewhere and that at least some of these uh, groups out there may have achieved technology that uh, we're looking at in the near future. So I think that's a possibility. On the other hand, there are certain very odd things about these UFOs, at least as, in terms of how people have reported them. First of all, you have many, many people who have claimed uh, to have had some form of contact with beings, right, that are said to be inside the UFOs or beings that visit their bedroom and take them, and we call that the abduction experience. This is a very, very difficult thing to assess because we're not dealing on the same level of evidence that we are dealing with in terms of a UFO report where we have radar tracking and radar plus visual or even landing traces that landed craft have made. And we do have a couple of very good ones, by the way. But when we're talking about claims of contact, this has turned out to be very elusive. On the other hand, it's very persistent. So I, I'm not inclined simply to dismiss all of these claims of contact, even though no one has been able to bring a little gray alien into my office yet. But you're asking, what are we dealing with? Well, I do think that we are dealing with creatures that some people have called the grays. And I think probably everyone listening, even if they don't care about UFOs, they know what a gray looks like because it, it, it is, you know, swamped our popular culture. Short little guys, big heads, big black eyes, small mouths, slits for mouths, no ears, you know, and they're skinny and they're very tiny, but they got big brains and they can do whatever they want to do with us, apparently. That's according to the many, many abduction accounts that we've gotten and so forth. I do happen to think that that is part of what we're dealing with. Uh, now, where are they from? What are they? Are they from another planet? Are they cybernetic organisms of some sort? Are they... Are they uh, creations of some sort? Are they, you know, an artificial life form? All of these are possibilities. Maybe all of them are true. I don't, I don't know. And I'm very happy to speculate, but I really feel that I have to make it clear whenever I do this to, to let people realize I don't know this answer, despite the fact that I've thrown my life into it now for nearly 20 years. I, I can't say that I have knowledge. Uh, but I will say I have interviewed in some detail, in great detail, quite a few people who have had encounters, quite a few. And A, I can tell you these people are, are truthful. In fact, many times I've had to, to physically like force them to calm down when they're talking to me. Heart rate goes up, rapid breathing. People get very upset when they start recollecting these experiences, I can tell you. And it's, it's troubling for me to talk to a man who's describing an event that took place 30 years ago and he still gets a rapid heart rate when he, when he talks about it. Or a lady who had an experience 40 years ago, and very intelligent people here. In any case, I think we're dealing with more than grays. I think we're dealing with entities that have, a well, a variety of appearances. Does that mean that they are able to uh, give a screen memory? that, you know, makes them look like something that they're not. I don't, again, I don't know. But we're dealing with entities that, that 
you know, they haven't they haven't overtly invaded. They haven't landed on the White House lawn. So whatever they're doing, they want to do it quietly. They want to do it to some extent by stealth, as I like to put it. That could be a good thing or that could be a, a not a very good thing. Uh, my attitude is I still have an open mind as to whatever the agenda of these others happen to be. And uh, if I were a counterintelligence officer charged with defending my nation's security, I would certainly have to keep open the, the possibility that some of these beings may not be very helpful for humanity. But beyond that, it's tough to know, Jonathan. Well, is it? And I, I want to follow up on that, but but just uh, I guess for the sake of the skeptics out there who say that you know personal accounts of visitations aren't sufficient evidence, uh, something right. that I've always found very interesting in support of the extraterrestrial extraterrestrial hypothesis is the incredible abilities of some of these ships and what they've been observed doing, you know, from the air by trained pilots on radar, uh, oh, from yeah. the ground, you know, what, what are some of the things that, that these ships can do that have been, that have been observed and documented? Uh, at the speeds of 9,000 miles per hour. How about that one? Uh, no, no radius turns. So in other words, like a right angle turn, uh, indefinite loitering. No, you know, no, why is that, can you explain, why is the, just, the right angle turn significant? Is it because of the, the inertia? I mean, that, do we have any sort of inertial damper that could, uh, you know, allow for that type of maneuverability right now? with a couple of things going on here. First of all, the, the, the non-radius turns have been observed going right to the 1940s. Uh, there, I have a report from 1947, American soldiers in Guam actually reporting a, an object coming at their base in a zigzag pattern, pretty wild for 1947, uh, and then just rapid acceleration away. Uh, you get these things a lot, and, and there, has been, there have been a number of very sophisticated scientific analyses of exactly how this could be. One, probably the best, was done by a retired NASA scientist, a very highly decorated man named Paul Hill, who just happened to have been a UFO witness in earlier years, so he didn't need the topic, uh, he didn't need to be convinced about it. And he, in his spare time, did a very detailed analysis that was posthumously, posthumously published. His assessment was that these objects do not violate our laws of physics, but what they do, everything is explainable, he says, if you assume that they have somehow figured out a way to create what he called a repulsive force field. That is essentially a version of an anti-gravity field that creates its own gravity around it that would actually enable you to um, deal because these objects, he says, don't make sense in terms of aerodynamics, but they do make sense in terms of a type of anti-grav force field, where you you could actually do all of those maneuvers without killing the pilots on the inside the craft and, and all of that. If you can cancel uh, out gravity, you can transcend the effects of inertia, basically. Exact. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, you know, even contemporary physicists don't really have a problem with that. The, the problem that, that they have is how, how to generate the field. And that's, that is the difficulty uh, that leads into a study of something known as electrogravitics, which has been an active area of study, or at least a, a quietly active area of study for many, many years. There is something to electrogravitics. There's really no question about it. The real issue is how powerful is the effect. So in other words, it is possible to achieve some level of gravity canceling effect through it, it would be like an ionization of the leading edge of of a of an air aircraft and the disc shape uh, like a flying saucer shape works best it turns out which is a very interesting thing hmm. so there are these ways of getting around it officially speaking our our scientific community has not made that breakthrough. There have been rumor after rumor within the classified world that this has been worked on since the 1950s. Uh, I think that that's probably the case. Uh, certainly, you know, there was a video that was leaked out of the Area 51 Groom Lake region in the 1990s, and it, it aired on the television show Hard Copy at that time, and it shows very clearly an object being tracked 
by technicians in Groom Lake. This is in Nevada by Area 51. And the object is moving in all of these incredible non-aerodynamic ways, baffling the people watching it. They're actually saying, what is that? That's a helicopter? No, that can't be a helicopter. What is that thing? We've been able to do analysis of it because the video that leaked out shows uh, a number of uh, pieces of data, like the altitude of the aircraft and its azimuth and so forth. So you could calculate its speed and its uh, maneuverability. And it, you know, it accelerated. It, it went from like 50 miles an hour or 30 miles per hour up to f over 500 within a minute or two, making right angle turns. In fact, it made a right angle turn at about 150 miles per hour at one point. Pretty amazing stuff. So my feeling is that within the classified world, our guys are in fact working on that technology. But uh, someone got there first. I don't think it was us. So there's a reverse engineering component to this then. Is that the implication? <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it looks like. Uh, in other words, you've got a phenomenon that has engaged. I mean, think about it just, uh, you know, like you're, you're the president, and it's back in the 1940s, so you're Harry Truman, and this incredible reality has just been dumped on you. Uh, and, and now you have to wonder, well, what do I do about this? Well, I think what you would probably have to do is, is have your people very quietly, very secretly study it. Uh, you certainly don't want to dump this on the world before you know what you're dealing with. Uh, that would not be very productive. Uh, you'd want to be able to study this technology to the, to the maximum extent possible. Uh, and I think that's exactly what they did. I think it's, it's taken many, many years for them to make some progress, but I think, I think some progress has been made. So we're living in a very strange world. We've got this, this phenomenon that all one has to do, as skeptical as someone may be, uh, I mean, there's a lot of websites out there that are, are really not the best websites, but there are some that are very, very good indeed and very sophisticated. And I think an intelligent person would be able to make a very quick discernment over what, what really matters out there. And you do that for a half hour, a couple of hours, and I think you'll see very quickly that there's enough evidence to show that this is a phenomenon that has gotten some serious attention. But, of course, it, it will never do for, for those powers that be, shall we say, to make this acknowledgment. If you make this acknowledgment, you, you open up a can of worms that where, where will it all end? It's a very, very difficult thing to predict, and so it's much easier, I think, from their point of view, just to act as though there's nothing going on. So I guess that, that brings us to the question then of, of, you know, if the government's been aware of this phenomenon since the 1940s uh, and has been managing it, trying to capture as much information as they can about this technology and, and potentially reverse engineer it, how has this issue been kept secret from us for so long, and what does that say yeah. about the structure of our society, of our media, of our academia? How, how has this been accomplished? Well, these are all very important questions to me personally and in my own study of this. And, and really, my answers have to come from inferring certain things. So, for instance, you know, one thing that I know is that this phenomenon is real. So then I ask myself, and by the way, uh, you know, this, this actually helps to answer your question as well. Uh, once my first book came out, which was a little over, well, about 12 years ago now, a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of very, very interesting high-level scientists and intelligence uh, individuals came out of the woodwork to say to me, hey, not a bad book. <laughs> you did okay there, kid. And I got to know a number of these people, uh, quite a few. One, one is a, a very, very high level, retired now, CIA um, scientist who one, at one point briefed Ronald Reagan on certain matters of national security. He's on a first name basis with many ex-presidents and former directors of the CIA and secretaries of defense. I've, I've had a number of long conversations with this man. There's another gentleman who's a colleague of his, is a top-level scientist, top-level physicist, uh, friendly. I don't know if he's friends, but friendly with Bill Clinton. Their daughters are friends. Uh, I've had long conversations with both of these men about this topic. Both of them don't believe it's real. Both of them know it's real. Um, and. 
find in in my discussions with them, as well as just my own my own analysis, of course. But really, what I can say is that we're dealing with a topic that's gone beyond government. And this is one reason why I think it's so effectively been maintained. I think the secrecy's evolved over the years. So that in the early years, when we had the Cold War to worry about, you got the United States and you got the Soviet Union. Uh, well, back then, so pretend that Roswell is real or, or other crash retrievals maybe. So it's not just that our guys learned that there are other beings there, but we actually recovered something that belonged to them. Let's just say that that happened. I believe that that happened. So if that's the case, now you've got this incredible technology. And, and the question arises, what do you do with it? Well, you, you don't want to tell the world about it because if you tell the world, then it becomes very difficult not to share it. And in 1947, the United States, for example, had a monopoly of atomic bombs, they, and t a nuclear technology. They certainly did not want to share that. So this is even more exotic. So no, I think their policy would be keep it secret. And what you do then is you eventually you've got to give this off to private industry. You have to. If you want this technology studied and, and if you want it to be replicated in any way, your best bet is to go to the contractors who build your equipment to begin with, whether they're Lockheed or Boeing or Raytheon or General Electric or General Dynamics or and so on. Eventually, in a very compartmented fashion, deeply compartmented, in other words, very much need to know only, um, you start introducing these, uh, you know, various segments of the technology so that in compartmented areas, these things are studied, and eventually breakthroughs will be made, I think. But what happens is that the secret goes farther and farther away. It becomes proprietary. I think this is, in fact, the way it's worked out. You look at American foreign policy, you ask yourself, who does, who does America really work for? Does it work for you, or does it work for private, powerful financial entities? I think we all recognize it's the latter, and I think the same is applied for the UFO uh, technology aspect of it. That you've got private entities that have now become dominant players, and that they've gotten their hooks into this system, so that the, the secret is not so much classified as it is proprietary at this point. That that's one way that this secret is actually quite effectively kept. If you were to ask Barack Obama for the UFO secrets. I'm very doubtful that he would really have much to say to you. It's quite possible that he's been briefed, but it's also very, very likely that he has little to no operational authority over the program. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of my CIA guys, and one day I'll be able to give these names up, but that's explicitly what he said to me. I asked him, I said, how much do presidents know? Everyone wants to know the answer to that one, right? And he said, well, some no, have known more than others. He stated unequivocally that Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and George Bush Sr. all knew. They all knew. And he had a few things to say to me about that. He stated his belief, not his knowledge, but his belief that Bill Clinton and George W. Bush did not know very much. And I, I spoke with him during the, the second Bush administration, so it was before Obama. But his feeling is that the, the that presidents are further and further removed from control. So back to your question, how is this secret kept? Well, I wish I knew every single nuance of how it's kept. But what, what I can see by looking at other areas of control of our society, not just UFOs, what we can see is that we have a, a what we call a mainstream media that's very tightly controlled, very, very tightly controlled. Uh, we have a political system that is very tightly controlled, and not, not just in the United States. We're talking around the world. Look, forget UFOs for a minute. Look at how tightly wound the uh, European political situation is and how, how little alternative media there really is in almost any of these nations in the world. I mean, you've got alternative media, but in all countries, they're relegated to the fringe. And you've got a very, very tight, almost monolithic mainstream media in most countries on planet Earth. So you look at that situation, and, and we already have control 
over secrets. So when one, someone wants to ask, how is the UFO secret kept? Maybe we need to ask, how are all kinds of secrets kept? Because that's really what's happened. And these secrets are kept in, in plain sight. I mean, for anyone who wants to learn about UFOs, as I said, you can do a quick Google search, and in a couple of days, you can have everything you want. The information is there. What, what keeps it, what keeps the wheel spinning in no forward motion is that we still are in a, a political structure in which all of that information is simply not acknowledged. And uh, that's, that's a remarkable situation. It's the same thing as something like with the Kennedy assassination, in which, you know, 80% of Americans and 100% of the rest of the world know that Kennedy was murdered in some kind of conspiracy. I mean, everyone knows this. But in a sense, within the U.S., it almost doesn't matter. Knowledge does not equate necessarily to power. It does not equate to political action. To illustrate, the government's in power can deny it. They can just keep going. Well, you know, to illustrate what you're talking, what you, what you mentioned, uh, you, particularly in regards to media control, uh, one of the incidents that I think really illustrates this beautifully, and something that really stood out to me even as a as a young child, was the Phoenix Lights incident in 1997. And for for people uh, who aren't yeah. familiar with this, uh, there was a basically an object that appeared to be over a mile wide that basically decloaked over Phoenix, Arizona, and was seen, or the outline of this thing was seen uh, by hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people, including the governor of the yeah. state. Uh, it was all over the news the next morning. Uh, it was on, you know, all the mainstream uh, morning shows. It was on CNN. And I remember seeing this and thinking, wow. And then, you know, all of a sudden, the the governor of Arizona comes out uh, and does a press conference, and they bring in this big, goofy guy in a, you know, gray alien costume, and they play right. it off as a joke, and they say, oh, don't worry. It was just the military dropping some flares. And, of course, anybody, you know, you can find this video on YouTube. Anybody who looks at this, it's very, very evident that these were not flares. I mean, they were stationary for in a very extended period in a very clearly defined shape. Um, and, you know, after the fact, the government, uh, the, excuse me, the governor of Arizona comes out and says, you know, he was pressured to do that press conference and he believes that there was a cover up going on. But, you know, within this, this extraordinary sighting, you know, within 24 hours of the whole world media covering it. All of a sudden, the story just disappeared, and I was, let's see, I was eight or nine years old at the time, and mm-hmm. I remember thinking, you know, well, well what's, where's the follow-up on this? This is such a cool story. Why is nobody reporting? Uh, and for a media, for our media to turn their backs on something that blatant, I think really illustrates how not necessarily controlled, although that might be the case at, at certain levels, but I guess in denial um, and afraid to break out of the status right. quo that so much of, of the media uh, has. Right. Very, very well put. I mean, back in 1977, the journalist Carl Bernstein, who was one of the Watergate investigators, one of the Watergate journalists, wrote an article for Rolling Stone magazine. It's a very important article, and it's an easy web search, in which he came out with the scoop, essentially, that during the... Uh, early 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s, that there were over 400 U.S. journalists who had been covertly working for the CIA. And we're talking major journalists here, top-level people. And in fact, the number almost certainly was much higher than that. Bernstein was being very conservative. Uh, It's probably in the thousands. So that, in other words, these, these journalists who ostensibly were independent were on the CIA payroll deeply influencing U.S. uh, media and U.S. policy. The CIA, in the aftermath of that, said, well, we don't do that anymore. But of course they do. And and their answer was very lawyerly, by the way. It was like, we no longer have such paid relationships with American journalists. Well, no, they don't need that paid relationships anymore. Journalists jump over each other in a big game of leapfrog to get to the CIA to be part of that. Uh, every because it's a career maker to have an in with the CIA or the Pentagon and so forth. So our media today is so incredibly compliant with national security, and you can see how stories across the board are reported almost synchronistically. Like you know, you can see how did Fox know that NBC was going to report that or CBS? They all report the same thing. Well, yeah, there's obviously levels of collusion regarding the Phoenix Lights. You pointed this out. It's very important to emphasize that Fife Symington, the governor 
of Arizona at that time. Yes, he did see. He, and, and he saw there were actually two, ver two phases of the Phoenix Lights. A lot of people don't remember. The first phase was not video recorded, but in fact might even be a better case. You had large numbers of witnesses seeing visually an enormous object. This was when it was still daylight. And this was reported all the way going uh, south down the state of Arizona. Excellent reports. And that's what Fife Symington actually saw. And it really disturbed him. So then in the aftermath of these sightings, as you say, there was a tremendous amount of media coverage. And because of that, there was deep, deep fear. And Symington referred to this. He said, we were really afraid of panic. And that's not the first time this type of thing happened. I'm living in uh, upstate New York, not very far from the Hudson Valley, where a decade earlier in the 1980s, the early 1980s, it was very similar there. For several years, there were waves of sightings of enormous triangular and boomerang-shaped craft. And, and it peaked in 1984 when, just like in Phoenix in 97, there was tremendous worry over panic because these objects were being seen over a major highway. And once again, you had a press conference in which the whole thing was just attributed, in this case, to uh, uh, flyers in, in tight formation with these tiny microlight aircraft. Absolutely impossible, but they got away with it. And in the, in the case of the Phoenix Lights, Symington comes out with this guy in the alien suit. Ha ha, really funny. And, but it, it worked for the mainstream media. They, that's what they wanted. They wanted a story to just push this all away. It, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a false truism. When you hear people say, oh, the media would love a story like UFOs, sure they would. No, they would not love this story. And we know this because every time they've been given the chance to deal with this in a truly serious manner, they've turned around and run away. They don't want this story. It's too much of a headache. Too much of a headache, and, and, and it goes against too many national security interests. As I mentioned, the Bernstein piece where you talked about the CIA, this, the U.S. national security communi uh, community is so deeply embedded in the mainstream media of this country. It's, one day there will have to be a really good book written on this. There's been some very good studies, but we, someone really needs to put it all together. This is a it's a, it's a grave – grave problem for the freedom of our press, where you've got so many military and intelligence operatives working within it. Well, um, this, is, this is all fascinating. Oh, uh, and, I and, wanna... and by the way, the same, the same thing applies to the academic world. Same thing applies. There are, uh, there's been a couple of very good academic studies on that phenomenon. That is, in other words, CIA, primarily I've seen these studies relating to the CIA, but I'm sure it, it's true with the, with the military penetration of, of major academic institutions so that, like, the CIA guy, at, guys at Yale and Harvard would act as, like, watchdogs or guard dogs against the sheep in the rest of the academic community. So if, if some professor at some little community college gets out of hand and writes about UFOs, then the, the big dogs would just smack them right back down. And that's how it works. Well, you know, you've, you've talked about uh, – so th this is all – fascinating ground and, and you know you've discussed the media's reticence to really cover the story and also the fear of a public panic which really segues well into uh, your latest book uh, ad after disclosure that i would love to discuss for a moment sure. uh, which you know you've really done a, a amazing job on this book first of all it's an incredibly entertaining read uh, just on you know those merits alone but uh it's really a fascinating war game scenario basically of of how disclosure might occur, how it might unravel, yeah. what how, you, how the media would respond, how governments would react, and and all of this. And you, would you be able to talk a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. I was very lucky in doing that book because I had a fabulous co-author, uh, Bryce Zabel, who was the creator and producer of a, a super cool television show of the late 90s called Dark Skies. I'm sure there are people listening to this who remember Dark Skies. And by the way, that's a show that has aged very, very well. It's still fresh. 
I recently amazing. watched it, and it was, uh, you know, really fun. And, and unlike the X Files, which was which was its contemporary, it really placed, uh, you know, the, almost every episode of the show took place in very real historical context. You know, the the main characters yeah. were interacting with JFK and RFK or, or the Beatles in one episode, and it gave it this really yeah. cool real world dynamic. Sorry, just interjecting that. Oh, ab- absolutely. And and the, the other thing that Bryce really focused on was the inside of the cover up in a way that you didn't get too much of that in the X Files. But in, be that as it may, Bryce, uh, where his talent really shined, I found, is in because he's a, he was a TV writer, he, unlike me as a historian, Bryce really has this gift of seeing real people react to real situations and, and kind of working that in. So there is a certain grittiness to AD after disclosure, uh, a certain kind of feet on the ground reality where you can actually see this kind of thing happening. And he encouraged me to think along those lines. And I, I believe that I certainly encouraged him to think uh, more conceptually and analytic, analytically, which is always my thing. So we were a good team. And really what we ended up doing is trying to think through two fundamental questions. Question number one is, can secrecy on UFOs ever really end? You know, can, can we actually achieve what people like to call disclosure? And then the second question is, if that's achieved, what happens? <laughs> like, what then to our society? Because, because what I found in, in all of my years, I've done so many uh, public lectures on UFO reality that, you know, as someone who believes in truth, and I do very strongly believe in that, it's, it's very easy for people to say, well, we need to have disclosure on this. We need to have the truth out. I believe that. But what I found a great lacking of was anyone who really tried to, to puzzle out, well, what would it do? Would it bring utopia where every, all of our problems are solved? Would it create new problems? I mean, what? So that's what we tried to do. So to deal with the first question, how could disclosure actually happen? Many people think, well, it's a ridiculous pipe dream. After all, we've had... If you believe in UFOs to begin with, well, we've had secrecy going now for one full human lifetime, about almost 70 years, and it hasn't cracked yet. So why, why do you guys think it's going to crack now? And the answer to that, the short answer, is that because history, time doesn't stand still. We are living through very dramatically fast-paced times here. Uh, this isn't, you know, we're in 2012. This isn't 1990. Man, this isn't certainly 1970 or 1950. We are so far ahead in our ability as a world to have a conversation with ourselves. Now, we consider the technology that's allowing you and me to have this conversation right now. We're talking on our computers, and it's you're recording it. This is going to go out to a podcast very, very soon. I mean, that type of capability, even 10 years ago, really wasn't nearly as widespread as it is today. And, and we're moving so far uh, in, into this future now. That they, I mean, consider what technologies we're going to have in another generation. We'll, we'll have on our little smartphones the ability to detect things that we can't even detect now. My iPhone's got an 8-megapixel camera, which is pretty nifty. It's got a nice video. And indeed, we're seeing people capturing video at rates that were just, there's nothing like this in the past. But soon we'll have probably infrared capabilities, for all I know, other types of detections of electromagnetic frequencies. My belief... We're talking about our iPhone basically becoming a tricorder. Yeah, that's from, right. From Star Trek. That's right. My, the non-geeks my, out there firmly held belief is that we are right on the cusp of a mass sighting. You mentioned the Phoenix Lights. If the Phoenix Lights had happened either in the daytime or today, (laughs) if it happened today, I think we might be in a very different place because you'd have recording capabilities that would be vastly, vastly better than what existed uh, 15 years ago. And I think that it's only a matter of time before a mass sighting occurs that, so to speak, hits the sweet spot, as it were, that gets the right
great number of witnesses recorded multiply that gets out there and becomes too difficult to deny. I believe that will happen. I think it's a matter of time. Another possibility would be a WikiLeaks type of event. You know, again, WikiLeaks is one of these things that didn't exist 10 years ago because really it couldn't exist 10 years ago. We, as a society, we didn't really have the technological infrastructure to allow for something like that. But we have it now, and WikiLeaks is here, and all other types of organizations. There's Anonymous. I think, I think it's a matter of time before very sensitive UFO data is leaked out and becomes a real problem. Something will happen. I don't know what this trigger will be, but I do believe that within another probably 20 years is a good guess, something will happen that will force this issue out. The today is not yesterday, and tomorrow will not be today. I feel like the secret keepers are like the, the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike, and we're the ocean, and here it comes. You can't stop the ocean from coming in. We're, we are changing as a society so rapidly that I believe that that's what's going to be the trigger somehow that will force this issue out. So then, so then it comes out. Well, one thing that I try to, to remind people is that just because something happens that forces a president to make an acknowledgement doesn't mean that the spin machine won't be kicking in in ultra high gear. It doesn't mean that they won't be holding key, uh, key information back to the maximum extent possible. And it doesn't mean that they won't even continue to lie. It just means that they will tell enough that they have to for as long as they're able to hold it back. And so that the moment of disclosure isn't the end of our struggle in the fight for truth. It's really just the beginning of a new phase for that. The big difference being, though, that with this topic now out there, out in the open, all of us will be allowed, as it were, to have an open discussion about this. And I think that that's going to be the real game changer. Once, once this topic's out and acknowledged, uh, I don't think it's going to take very long for the rest of the world to catch up, get up to speed, to find out, you know, what's, what is, what's the best literature out there? What are the best thoughts on this? And they're going to be putting these questions to their political leaders around the world. That's where it's really going to be difficult. You're going to have the, the forces, essentially, of the people, on the one hand, wanting truth. And you're going to have those few people who have had access to that truth uh, really not wanting to give up access to that truth. That's, that's how I'm looking at it right now. Now, maybe that, it won't go down that way. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe there'll be this grand dump of data, of information, and it's all out there. But I, I don't know. I think that that's a real risky, risky proposition. Well, the problem with disclosure is that so many things now are at risk. Uh, for example, imagine it happens. So there's this big sighting. Uh, Bryce and I picked the city of Montreal as, as an example. Massive city, sighting over Montreal that's recorded on 20 different, uh, you know, multiple uh, recorders. And it becomes an undeniable event. And two and a half weeks later, the president is forced to go on TV and say, yes, uh, my, my science advisors have advised me that this is a real phenomenon that doesn't belong to our civilization. So like it's out there. So immediately, people are going to ask a few questions. I mean, besides the fear-based questions of like, who are these beings and do we have anything to worry about? They're going to ask some very difficult political questions like, how the hell have you been able to keep this secret all these years? Exactly what you were asking earlier. And indeed, that's going to be a very difficult and, and unpleasant situation to deal with because it will inevitably and rapidly uh, involve an analysis of the deep corruption of our political system, the deep corruption of our intellectual uh, infrastructure, academic, scientific world, the media, all of that will be, be understood to be, have been compromised. So a lot of heads are going to roll just on a straight out political basis in the immediate aftermath of disclosure. And that by itself is going to give a lot of incentive for the secret keepers not to give too much up. But see, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very difficult. And how all 
that will end up, your guess is as good as mine, except I think there's going to be a real struggle between the, the few and the many. That's, you know, on a very fundamental issue of obtaining the truth. That's going to go on for a while, too, I suspect. Because one of the unsatisfying things very well might be that the, the moment of disclosure will come because we as a society may have developed the capability of proving that they, whatever they are, that they're here. But we may not have yet, yet gotten to the capability of grabbing one of these gray aliens and putting them up on the stage next to the president. We may not be able to prove to a, a perfect degree of satisfaction just who they are. So that we could be at this interim stage for, for quite some time where, yeah, we know they're here, but who the hell are they? What's their agenda? That could, that could be causing social debate for many, many years after the fact. We've only got about 10 minutes left, and there's a, there are a couple follow-ups that I, I want to make on that. Uh, you know, another one of the questions that people are going to ask, and this is coming from your book, uh, another one of the questions that people are going to ask when any sort of disclosure, even a limited disclosure, occurs is, what are these ships, what, what power source are these ships running on? Because it's very clearly right. not gasoline. And if it becomes clear that the U.S. government has been reverse engineering this technology – uh, and that we may have tapped into some sort of quote free energy. You know, this was this was also the, the thesis of Foster Gamble's uh, very popular recent documentary yeah. film Thrive. Uh, That's right. You know, so do you think that free energy disclosure and and eventual release goes hand in hand with the extraterrestrial disclosure? And you know, what are the implications of this for society? Yeah. Excellent point, and that, that's one of our contentions in writing AD is that the energy question is, is about at the heart of all of this. It's, if it's not the heart, it's, it's next to the heart. It's right there. It all comes down to replacing petroleum. For 150 years, our world has been dominated by petroleum as its primary source of energy. And let's not forget, petroleum's done an incredible job. It's very uh, powerful. It's portable. It works great. It pollutes, unfortunately. It has its limitations. So we've developed a multi-trillion dollar global industry. It, it, you know, it's, it's possibly the largest industry in the world. Um, and the reality is, I mean, even a 10-year-old is going to realize that these flying saucers don't use petroleum as their source of power. So they, there's implicitly an, a recognition that they are using something different. Uh, my, my personal speculation is that uh, it could be a form of, uh, of clean nuclear fusion, which to me, for our society, is, is quite attainable and I think will be attained within another 20 years or so. And I do realize that this has been claimed for the last 50 years, like, oh, yeah, we're 10 to 20 years away from fusion. But I really do believe that now we are about – about 20 years away from fusion. And, and less people don't realize, fusion is vastly different from our current nuclear technology, which is uh, fission-based. So in fission, you take a uh, you know, radioactive atom and you blast it apart, and, and you get a tremendous amount of energy, and you get a lot of radioactive toxicity. Fusion is different. Fusion, you're, you're fusing two heavy hydrogen atoms, uh, tritium and deuterium, and you're getting – the byproduct is helium, which is inert and not dangerous, as well as a vast, vast, vast amount of energy, far beyond anything we've gotten with fission. And I think that it is around the corner. It will transform our own society. But it certainly would provide more than enough power to create the electrogravitic fields that I think – are the propulsion system of these craft. So it could very well be a form of fusion with electrogravitics, or some of the more exotic possibilities would be uh, tapping what's called the zero-point energy field. And I'm of two minds about zero-point energy, uh, because really no one agrees on how much energy really is there. Is it vast, or is it just you know, less than a teaspoonful. Uh, there are a lot of scientists who have tried to extract this energy, and the results are very, very minimal at this point. That doesn't mean that we won't make a breakthrough. But there, 
there's something there. There, whatever UFOs are, you see, the implication is they are using something that we're not using. And and realistically, once the acknowledgement is out that they are here, ask yourself, how long will it really take before, when you get the entire scientific community of you know propulsion experts and physicists looking at this, do we really honestly think they're not going to figure something out really quickly? The biggest obstacle to getting answers to almost anything is knowing that the solution is possible. Once you know it's possible, you'll find a solution. And I think whatever, whether it's fusion, zero-point energy, or anything else, it's going to be found shortly after disclosure. And that portends a massive transformation away from the world's largest industry, which is petroleum. And that's, that'll come with some disruption, for sure, financially, economically, politically. Uh, in the long run, it's certainly going to be a very good thing for us. In the short run, it's going to be a bumpy road, I'm sure. Again, uh, this is all uh, fascinating and very insightful, and I think that uh, the free energy uh, issue is, is, like you said, really central to this, and yeah. could really usher in a, a new era for humanity if this technology is developed uh, as a result of eventual disclosure. Now, at the same time, there are a lot of challenges, like, you know, how do we roll this out in a safe way? Do we want every Joe Blow in his backyard to have access to an unlimited power source? Uh, but, you know, I think that we'll be able to, to figure that out eventually and that it could really be a, a page turner for human civilization right. that could address a lot of our, our challenges as a species right now. But, you know, we're almost out of time uh, for this first episode, but there were two things that I want to cover uh, really quickly in, in brief. And one of those is, you know, how, what is the intent of these beings you know you mentioned the 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 so-called grays and that mm -hmm. some of their interests they may not necessarily have our best interest at heart uh but at the same time there you know the universe is a big place and we may be interacting on some level with a variety of species uh and some contact reports have have been very positive mm -hmm. as well uh and yeah. One of the things, you know, people like Stephen Hawking have been coming out and, and saying, oh, if there are extraterrestrials and they make contact, they're probably aggressive. And well, one of the things that stands out to me with all of this is that, well, one, you know, we know that they're here on some level or we have a pretty good idea of that. But if they were overtly hostile, it seems that they very clearly have the ability to wipe out or take over the planet if they wanted to because their technology is so vastly advanced but they haven't done so so you know whether their their motives are positive or negative uh you know why why are they not why have they not made overtly hostile advances and also might it be possible that some of the beings that we're dealing with are governed by some sort of prime directive for lack you know again i'm referencing star trek here but uh, mm -hmm. Basically, a, a, a system of law or, or code that says that you can't interfere, you know, interfere with a developing species uh, before they're ready, before they're really out in the stars. Does well, that seem feasible let, to you? Let's take let let's let's uh, go on an assumption that there are there's laws out there, and let's go on another assumption that there are multiple groups out there. And I think if if that's our assumption, that actually explains a lot, because it would explain that there, there would be some positive interactions. And it could also explain why any negative species have not wiped us out, because maybe they are constrained as well. Maybe they're not allowed. Uh, it could very well be that you're dealing with uh, a species that might want to, I mean, this is all hypothetical here, but a species that might want to subvert humanity for one reason or another, but cannot do so openly because we belong to someone else. We were created by someone else, let's say. That's a possibility. In other words, the, the idea that we're dealing with multiple groups in some kind of, that belong to some kind of greater collective or society, not a collective, but civilization, that actually, to me, explains things pretty well. And it would explain, uh, you know, the, the positive and the negative in a way that I makes sense to me. I, I've always been troubled by statements by, say, for example, Dr. Stephen Greer, who has had a lot to say on this. And one of the, these famously in the UFO field has said, well, they, they really, they cannot be hostile because, look, 
they clearly have the ability to wipe us out and they haven't done so. So they're obviously using restraint. But I don't really find that logic totally persuasive. Um, when you start looking at the details of abduction experiences, you get the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it's all, it's all there. Um, so I, my sense is that we're dealing with multiple types of agendas. That's my sense at this time. Interesting. Okay. Well, uh, my uh, buzzer just went off, so we're about out of time. I really wanted to broach the issue of uh, crop circles with you, but we might have to do that on another occasion. Uh, just to wrap things up briefly, if our listeners want to dive deeper into the UFO subject, uh, your books are truly a fantastic place to start. I cannot recommend them highly enough. Uh, and the three uh, that we'd recommend are UFOs and the National Security State, Volumes 1 and 2, and AD uh, 